Good afternoon, everybody. I call the Senate Housing and Homelessness Prevention Committee in order we have a quorum. Today we're hearing five bills, all of which will be laid over for possible inclusion. Inclusion in our supplemental omnibus bill. And we have, first up, we have Senator Bolden's 3647 bill. You're already up there. Um, and please begin, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. So I do have uh, Senate File 3647. I do have a uh, very brief uh, author's amendment. I would move the A1 if we could adopt that first, Madam Chair. Sounds good. Senator Bolden moves the A1 amendment. Any discussion? No? Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Um, all opposed say nay. The amendment is adopted. Senator Bolden, please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just note to members that the amendment just changed uh, one typo, changed one may to a must. Uh, so, members, throughout this session, we have heard many bills in this committee to, that attempt to fill gaps and holes in our publicly funded housing system. Senior LIHTC housing is unaffordable for many participants that it serves, and affordable housing developers and operators have discussed the difficulty in maintaining their properties. We know this is due in large part to the expense of operating costs. We also know that the one-time investments we made last year will eventually run out, and we need investments in sustainable and long-term solutions. We know our federally funded programs have significant limitations that hamper the ability of housing providers to adequately cover operating costs. They also have not grown in decades. One area that we have not explored enough is, our, is the role of our local municipalities, particularly our counties, in creating, owning, and maintaining housing for their communities. Known as locally owned housing, several counties in Minnesota have developed a sustainable response to the lack of consistently and permanently affordable housing in their communities. These programs are marked by a couple of characteristics that set them apart from other publicly funded programs. One, they are permanently affordable, as they stay in the public trust for decades or longer. And two, they are self-sustaining. The flexibility in these programs allows counties to rent to a mix of income ranges for the purpose of meeting needs of various communities and to create a self-sustaining housing program that can keep up with ongoing operating costs. The higher rents and market rate rents help to subsidize and pay for the entire locally owned program. In your packets, I will draw your attention to a letter from Melissa Taphorn, who is the director of Washington County CDA, uh, and she notes her support. Uh, and in my own district, Olmstead, the Olmstead County HRA is a model of locally owned housing. They have a variety of housing types, include scattered site housing owned by the county itself. The mix of rents and local levy help keep sustainable operating costs. Last year, they decided to stop contracting with outside management companies and have brought management of properties in-house. This not only helps with costs, but aligns the values of the HRA with the delivery of housing. I also know that Olmstead County prides itself on being a responsive and responsible landlord. Consistent funding, however, could turn the program fully self-sustaining to free up the levy for other affordable housing needs. Both Olmstead and Washington counties and other counties could be doing so much more for this model if they had access to capital. The creation of a new revolving fund at MHFA would be the start of a self-generating -gener housing system that will complement our other state and federal programs. Uh, I want to make, just make a note about the appropriation. So obviously the um, uh, amount uh, in the bill and the amount needed would exceed our budget target for this year. Uh, I would say that $500 million would provide, on average, close to $6 million per county in Minnesota, which would be enough for some counties to start their programs, and some counties may need a little bit more. But uh, even not being able to fulfill that uh, entire need this year, uh, even a smaller amount, a modest investment to sort of jumpstart this program would get us some tremendous return on investment for the growth of these programs statewide. Uh, and with that, uh, Madam Chair, I would turn it over to my testifiers, the first who will briefly walk through the bill, and the second to highlight how growing this program statewide uh, will help a variety of communities. Thank you, Senator Bolden and Sean Burke. Uh, please state your name for the committee and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Sean Burke. I'm with O'Connell Consulting. We work with a coalition of organizations, including Inquilinos Unidos, who are focused on increasing various housing options in our state. 
Before I briefly walk you through the bill, I just want to note that um, the locally owned and controlled housing model in many ways was pioneered by Montgomery County in Maryland, whose HRA has been building and operating publicly owned housing for decades. The key to building a successful program like this is getting the balance correct between making sure counties are fulfilling the, the housing needs in their communities, but also providing a right uh, flexibility so that they can provide market rate uh, rents as well to get that formula right for the self-sustaining part of this program. So uh, here is how this bill attempts to do that. In subdivision one, which establishes the uh, revolving loan fund, you'll see all of the uses that a uh, county or a municipality can use with this capital. Subdivision two lays out uh, several definitions. You'll note that an eligible household uh, does go up to 400% of area median income, which is larger than most programs that this committee is used to. But again, that's to provide the flexibility so that counties can rate uh, rent to uh, market rate renters to help sustain the program. And an eligible recipient uh, is a county or a tribe or a city. Locally controlled housing itself means a property where 75% of the stake is owned by the municipality. Uh, there are also situations uh, under which the municipality can own the land, but um, a nonprofit can own the building. Subdivision three lays out some uh, management and repayment requirements. And then subdivision 4B, this is that kind of magic formula that has been alluded to. Again, in order to make a program like this successful, a county needs to be able to recoup costs and maintain its operating costs by having some level of uh, market rate rents available. But of course, we also want to make sure that the housing needs of deeply affordable and affordable households are met as well. And so uh, subdivision uh, 4B is one way to do that. Uh, it's not necessarily an exact science, so it also gives the agency MHFA uh, some flexibility in working with counties to get their uh, formula just right. Subdivision 5 uh, includes some additional requirements for this program, including some important protections to make sure that units are not segregated by uh, the amount of money that a renter is paying. And subdivision six governs the sale of a property. This too is not an exact science. A key feature of this program is that it is permanently affordable. Um, and so potentially uh, 50 years uh, might not be uh, enough in some situations and could be looked at. Uh, and then subdivision seven and eight lay out some other requirements of the agency. Uh, in sum, want to thank the committee for uh, hearing this bill and excited um, to see ideas uh, like this take off in the future. And I can stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Jennifer Arnold, if you can say your name for the record and begin your testimony. Great. Uh, yeah, my name is Jennifer Arnold. I work with Inquilinos Unidos por Justicia. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I am executive director of Inquilinos Unidos por Justicia, and we've been working with BIPOC and low-income renters for 10 years now. Um, in the last 10 years, our struggles for dignified and affordable housing have become really predictable. Um, we, we organize in the style of a union, so we organize all the renters who are in the same building or renting from the same landlord, and we start by getting folks together and talking about what's happening, what are the problems that people are facing. And we only organize in buildings where the problems are very serious. So like mold covering the whole wall or cockroach and mice infestations um, and many, many more things. Water leaks, lack of heat in the winter. You get the idea. Um, and we organize to get repairs. And we do that through conversations with the landlord, but we'll also try things like working with city inspections and going to court. Um, usually when we do that, that process, renters then face pressures of rent increases or evictions, threats of eviction. So then we organize to make sure folks can stay in their homes. And then the persistent repair issues are ongoing and continue. So it, for folks that I work with, it feels like we're in this constant cycle of trying to have dignified housing um, that folks can stay in and that it never stops. And so 
and, and the hardest part is that this cycle continues until the landlord sells and then it only gets worse because the landlord has sold for, the, the new landlord has bought the building for more money and needs to pay off that loan. And the, the way to do that is by raising rents and not making repairs. And so we've got this ongoing set of really challenging um, conditions. And um, so for us, and this even happens when the landlord is an affordable owner because usually they don't have the cash to make the repairs on the deferred maintenance that the buildings have suffered, no? So um, for us, we've really looked at what are long-term solutions to this problem? What are ways out? And we've done some experiments. We're um, working with five buildings in South Minneapolis that are converting into a tenant-owned co-op, um, which is a really exciting project, really hopeful. And you know, we've been working for four years to fundraise the money to make that work. Right? The funding streams for that are also really challenging. And that brings us you know, to like, what, what are our options? Our members include folks who don't qualify for public assistance because of being outside the income limits or are, can't get it for other reasons like waiting lists. And, um, and so for us, we, we want new models. Um, it's time for us to invest in other models to make the housing system work across our state. There are already ex alternatives that you heard about in counties in Minnesota and the example like Olmstead County is really um, exciting to us because it's a place where the purpose of the county is to keep people in their homes, not evict people, so you won't get evicted for you know, being behind one month in your rent. And the purpose is also to make sure the housing is dignified, um, which feels like something that really matters for our membership. So um, we would love to move forward on this to make, make it easier for other counties to follow Olmstead's lead to be able to try experiments like this. Um, and to have a, a business model that actually works ongoing to make the repairs needed in these buildings. Um, thank you for your time, and I can stand for any questions. Thank you so much. Um, members, questions? Um, Senator Jayham. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm sure it surprises you I want to speak to this, but thank you for bringing it forward. Um, I, I like the concept. And I like revolving funds, so I, you know, I, I like that. But I, I, I just want to make sure all the members are aware that I, I agree with the concept, what you're trying to accomplish. But when it comes to single-family homes, we have no inventory for that bottom third of um, the market, and we still have this big gap in ownership for people of color versus people like me. Um, and I think this is only gonna make it worse and, and not better. Um, something to think about, I know this is being laid over. Um, and then the other issue I probably have is the 50 year concept. Um, I, I don't think any of us have crystal ball. And, and I do think that there should be strings attached to uh, make sure people aren't flipping it. But communities change, needs change, technology changes. Um, but here you're gonna have a, a deed restriction on the property for 50 years. So I, I, I do think that's too long. Um, but I'm glad you have something on it. Um, and then I, I don't know why we're requiring to hire a person for MHFA to hire one person. They must hire someone. Um, I, I, I don't know why we're requiring them to hire someone if they feel they have the staff. Great, if not, they can let us know. But the way the bill's drafted, they are required to hire someone. Um, but I thank you for bringing it forward. Senator Bolton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. I uh, appreciate your comments and uh, am happy to work with you if you uh, would like to work on the language. Um, you know, we do have a supply issue. We have had many conversations uh, in this committee about that. And, uh, you know, this bill is not going to, you know, fix all of our housing problems, but it is going to um, bring another option for counties uh, to be able to, to, you know, as another puzzle 
piece in the big puzzle of things here. So, um, you know, we need options as as we describe this as working well in in several counties already, and so want to be able to expand those opportunities to other counties who um, want to try it uh, to be able to, you know, house more folks in our communities where there are significant needs. So, I appreciate your comments. All right. Uh, any other questions? Seeing none, this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator Bolden. The next uh, item on the agenda is my bill, Senate File 2040, and I will hand the gavel over to Senator Bolden. Senator Mohammed, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Before you is Senate File 2040, an appropriation for FHPAP. Um, and before I begin, Madam Chair, I'd like to introduce the A1 amendment. Senator Mohammed moves the A1 amendment. Any questions about that, members? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Motion carries. The amendment is adopted. Senator Mohammed. Thank you. I appreciate that, Madam Chair members. Um, Senator Mohammed, would you also like to move the A3 at this time? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Senator Mohammed moves the A3. Members, any questions about that? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Motion carries, and the amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Mohammed, to your bill as amended. Thank you so much. Members, it is easy to go through uh, the motions of every day here. We hear bills, add amendments. Sometimes it, it's easy to lose sight of the, tremendous, of the tremen, tremendous privilege and power we have here, the sacred responsibility we have at protecting and improving the lives of Minnesotans. As I present this bill today, I ask you to be fully present in the spirit of compassion that I know each of us have. Family Homelessness Prevention and Assistance Program, or FHPAP, is an important tool in reducing homelessness and creating long-term stability for families. The Family Prevention Homelessness and a homelessness and assistance program provides supportive, health, supportive services and financial assistance to both families and individuals across Minnesota. FHPAP's flexibility allows it to be one of the most one of the best programs this state has to uh, to assist families and individuals with their immediate needs, such as rent deposits, rent payment, rent payments, or utility payments. Eligible households that are either experiencing unsheltered um, homelessness or at risk or at imminent risk of homelessness. If FHPAP is the one program that we have at the state that can address the needs across, across the housing continuum from experiencing unsheltered homelessness to avoiding foreclosures for low-income um, homeowners, the initial dollar amounts in this bill intro were introduced in 2023 are reflective of the need that we have across the state. To illustrate the need that FHPAP provi providers majority of, of which are community action agencies across the state typically release FHPAP resources quarter, quarter, quarterly and run out on an average within two weeks. We know that today's amendment of $10 million will not solve our housing instability and housing access challenges, but it is but it is much needed and will help hundreds of families across, hundreds of families and, and individuals across the state of Minnesota. And with that, I have a few testifiers with me. Uh, very good. We'll move to testimony. Our first testifier is Patty Paulson. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee. I am Patty Paulson, the Housing Stability Director at Neighborhood House. 
I am testifying in support of SF 2040. I want to thank all of you for the additional resources appropriated in 2023 for FHPAP, including entrusting Neighborhood House with a $2.4 million direct appropriations to provide FHPAP funding. I'm here today not to represent just Neighborhood House, but to represent the perspective of FHPAP providers in all of Minnesota. FHPAP providers are very similar to the households that come to us needing help. Each month we have very limited funds to meet all the requests for assistance that we receive. Just like households with limited funds, providers have to make choices and none of those choices are easy. During the last six months, Neighborhood House had approximately 80, excuse me, 800,000 in funding to assist households in need. We were able to help 443 households. Those numbers are great, right? Well, no, because during that same time period, we received requests from 1,892 households, including some that were going through eviction court needing almost $4.3 million. We're unable to help more than 75% of the people that are reaching out to us. And we were only able to help with less than 18% of the funding requested. We're just one provider in one county. Imagine the numbers for the rest of the state. But what does this really mean? It means we have to turn families away. But the bigger question is, where are they really gonna go? Because all of us are in the same situation. Which households are gonna win the lottery and be helped? And which ones are going to have to struggle even longer and potentially become homeless? This is the same dilemma that the families needing help are facing in their own homes, the scarcity of resources. However, like the families that we help, even a small amount of funds can change the situation drastically. And any increase in FHPAP funding has the same result to the FHPAP providers as to the households that receive those funds. Providing FHPAP funds is a great use of public dollars and has lasting results in helping families thrive. Any increase in funding will result in positive housing outcomes for the households that we serve. One thing for all of us to remember is that data and numbers are important, but not as important to each and every household in Minnesota. We as providers cannot lose sight of the people behind the numbers, and we request that you don't do that either. Thank you again for allowing me to testify today and providing the perspective of an FHPAP provider in Minnesota. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, Shay Diaz, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Porter and committee members. My name is Shay Diaz. I'm a Native American mother of three. I live in the Twin Cities. I'm here to testify on preventing homelessness because I've experienced this myself and I want to help others. I currently have a place, although it's not in the neighborhood of my choice. There weren't many options of where to live, so I had to take it. I had to I'd like to share that, I'm sorry. I'd like to share that the first time I became homeless due to a tornado when I lived in North Minneapolis, I had nothing as the tornado took everything. I applied for emergency assistance. This included FHPAP, but I was unable to find some place to live because there was such a demand for financial assistance. They made me go through an intensive process to simply apply for help. In order to get my own place, I needed help for furniture, funds, and you know, rental deposits, and then somebody to help me navigate through this process, which exactly the FHPAP can do. Second, I was homeless due to COVID because I was a manager at a local bar, and as you know, bars were shut down. I had plans to move into a house, but COVID interfered due to so many things shutting down and not being able to get help, which made me stay in a hotel for nine months. I had to use my COVID stimulus, unemployment, and I had money saved up, 
When my first option for a place fell through, I had to submit and pay application fees and didn't have any luck. I am grateful now to have my own place. It's not the neighborhood of my choice, although I am fearful of moving out because I do not want to become homeless again. When I found my current home, if F, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, if FHPAP had the funding for financial assistance and advocacy, I would have had the opportunities. In addition, in addition to the help with paying for moving costs, not only is time consuming, but also to find the resources. While this is my experience, I know others, <clears throat> others feel the same and increase to the I'm sorry, I know, <clears throat> I know others feel the same and an increase to FHPAP would help them out tremendously. Opportunities are available, but they are not enough and the process is very difficult. That's why FHPAP is so great because of its financial flexibility and they can provide supportive services. Not everyone facing homelessness has high barriers and simple need a, a hand in helping to advocate and get the money to get out of their crisis. <clears throat> thank you, Chair Port. I'm sorry. And thank you, Chair Port and committee members for hearing my testimony. Preventing homelessness is more affordable than responding to homelessness. And FHPAP is the best tool we have to do this. Thank you for your testimony. <coughs> Senator Muhammad, any other comments before we move to discussion? Thank you, Madam Chair. No other comments. Discussion or questions? Senator Pock. I just want to speak in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Muhammad, for bringing this. And thank you to the testimonies that were given today. Uh, as someone who used to work on uh, the, the FHPAP program through HAP, uh, I saw firsthand how it helped families stay in their homes and prevent homelessness. It's the unique parts of this program that really assist people to navigate through the system that's often hard, um, that provides them with all the support that they need, the assistance, navigation, uh, whether it's for rent, utility, uh, eviction prevention. There's so much in this program that, um, that is, comes together in one place. And the nonprofits that administer this program are incredible because they understand uh, the barriers that people have to accessing assistance. So I just want to put my support on this because I've seen time and time again through direct work in the community that this program works and it helps people. So thank you so much for coming out and testifying uh, and you've got my support. Other discussion members? Uh, I will just say thank you, Senator Muhammad, for bringing this bill. Um, this uh, is a, an important program that directly impacts people's lives. I, uh, Ms. Paulson, you uh, spoke about not um, uh, just seeing numbers uh, and, and wanting us to realize that there are people behind those numbers. I really appreciate that. And Ms. Diaz, you helped us to um, see that picture and by sharing your story. So thank you for that. And it is important that we remember to think about the, the people who are... Um, benefiting from this program and the stories and lives that they uh, bring to this. So thank you for that. Senator Muhammad, any final closing comments? Um, I would just say thank you to the committee for hearing the bill um, and for considering it. I think there is a great need. Um, I think part of the reason why we are in this predicament is because of uh, years of policy failures. Um, and that is why we have millions of people outside um, and so I hope this is a step in the right direction. It will not fix, it's not a solution um, for all of it, but it is a step in the right direction. And I want to thank you for considering it. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. So Senate file 2040 will be laid over for further consideration. And with that, I will hand the gavel back to Senator Mohammed.
Next, we have Senate File 4592, Senator Zhang's bill. Um, please present your bill, Senator Zhang. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, committee members. I have uh, before you Senate File 4592. Uh, this bill appropriates uh, $900,000 to MHFA to provide to the Wilder Foundation for its triennial uh, Wilder uh, homelessness, homeless, homelessness uh, study. Um, you know, this study has uh, been conducted with uh, the Wilder research, um, you know, since 1991. Um, this research and the information that the, the study provides has been used uh, in many you know, government level decision making processes. Um, you know, I have, there was the, uh, you know, Department of Health that uses the information gathered from uh, similar studies as this to provide analysis for grants specific to pregnant women, uh, for uh, funding programs to address homelessness here in the state of Minnesota. Um, and uh, I think this, this is something that is very much needed. The more information we have, the better we can address the homelessness uh, here in this state. And I have uh, with me Michelle that um, that is from Wilder and can provide more information. Thank you, Senator Zhang. And Michelle, please introduce yourself for the committee and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Michelle Gerard. I'm a senior research manager at Wilder Research, and I'm the co-director of the Minnesota Homeless Study and the Reservation Homeless Study. So thank you for having me here today. Um, I'll just give a quick overview of this study. I know this committee is probably fairly aware of the study, but we've been conducting the study statewide since 1991. It's done every three years all across our state the last Thursday in October. Uh, we go to over 400 shelters throughout our state, so emergency shelters, domestic violence shelters, and transitional housing facilities. And then we also work with advocates and outreach workers and food shelf folks um, to interview people who are not staying in shelters. So those folks who are completely unsheltered or um, moving around from place to place, couch hopping, and then going into shelter or staying outside. Um, the last time we did this study was just this past October, um, and so we are uh, fresh from uh, conducting the study after um, being behind for two years because of the pandemic. And so um, if you're aware of this study, you know that it's a very deep study. It's kind of well-known flagship um, study in the country uh, for our ability um, to really dig in deep on folks' characteristics of homelessness. So it's a 30 to 45 minute face-to-face -face interview um, telling the stories um, through data of about 5,000 people experiencing homelessness in our state. Um, we also are sort of well known in the country for uh, our partnership with tribal nations. So since 2006, every three years, we've partnered um, with sovereign tribal nations to conduct a similar study at about the same time um, with our northern Ojibwe partners. Um, so that's very unique and, and um, kind of the only um, way that's happening in our whole country right now. Um, so this information is used, like Senator Zhang said, um, for, by policymakers in our state. Um, I think sometimes people are surprised that this study isn't funded with a legislative appropriation. We've been sort of cobbling together funds um, from different state agency partners. It's a public-private partnership, so as well as philanthropy to fund the study over the years since 91. Um, it's become increasingly difficult and time consuming to cobble together do the dollars and that's why we're here today. Um, it's just a lot of time that could be spent in communicating the information, um, preparing reports, um, doing presentations to the community, which we do. We go out and talk to faith communities. Uh, we go out and we talk to different public forums. We talk um, to anybody who's interested in learning more about the situation with homelessness in our states. And then the information is also used by pretty much every program in the state to um, design their services and improve, um, as well as like target programs for um, trends, things that we're seeing um, increase or decrease over the time so that we can really um, sort of have the, the knowledge to um, be effective in our work. Um, and so that's why we're here today. Um, 
we would urge you to support this bill, and I'm um, happy to stay to take any questions. Thank you, Michelle. Um, members, any questions, discussions? For Senator Zhang's bill? Senator Pa? Uh, I, too, just want to... Okay. I thought I turned myself off instead of on. Um, I, too, just want to say thank you, uh, Senator Hyung and uh, the Wilder Foundation for bringing this forward. I'm very familiar with the uh, of Wilder Foundation's work, especially when it comes to research. There uh, are state agencies, local governments, nonprofits, organizations, et cetera, et cetera, have for many, many years depended on the research that comes out of Wilder for a lot of the work that we do. Uh, and Wilder Foundation has earned its respect in place as a leader and as a source for information. Um, and that's due to a lot of your leadership and the work that you guys do at Wilder. So I just want to support this because you're right in that Wilder has been able to get funding for a lot of the work that it does, but there's times where we have to fund those projects too. And, um, and so I'm in support of this. Thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you, Thank you Senator Pa. Um, Senator Zhang, closing comments? Um, thank you, for, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Pa, for your uh, words, and um, you know, thank you for all community members. I know it's been received uh, bipartisan support in the past. I uh, look, look forward to seeing this pass this session. Thank you. Thank you, and this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Next, we have uh, Senate File 4077, Senator Paul's bill. And Senator Pa, you can begin your testimony on the bill. Okay. Chair Mohammed and members, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to present my bill, which is SF 4077, which is asking for an appropriation of $30 million in a one-time funding to Minneapolis Foundation for the Groundbreak Coalition. And this is to expand home ownership opportunities for community members. Funds will be used for down payment assistance, home preservation, and capacity building grants for nonprofit partners administering the assistance. For over 50 years, government, nonprofits, financial institutions, and foundations have piloted programs that expand home ownership and wealth building opportunities. But they have never been financed at the scale needed. Today, the Groundbreak Coalition is working to do this. And what is super exciting about this work is that the coalition is building a regional system that unlocks more private capital. Through deep collaboration with financial institutions, philanthropy, corporations, nonprofits, and other public sectors, the coalition is working to unlock $5.3 billion in capital over the decade for aspiring homeowners, entrepreneurs, and developers. This initiative seeks to shift the burden of organizing resources from nonprofits and individuals to the institutions that hold capital to affect change on a scale that can shrink racial wealth gaps. This new initiative will be starting in the seven county metro area as it is established, it can expand statewide. Through this bill, we have an unprecedented opportunity to leverage and maximize resources to create a more equitable and prosperous state for all of us. Madam Chair and members, I do have two testifiers here today, and then after that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senator Pa and um, Mr. Edwards. Yes. You can can you state your name for the record and begin your testimony? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Don D. Edwards. I'm the new project director of Groundbreak, and I've been with the coalition since it launched, serving on its steering committee and acting as the co-chair of the Home Ownership Work Group. The, uh, the Groundbreak Coalition was formed in 2022 after the murder of George Floyd to reimagine a dramatically more inclusive and equitable region. 
It includes philanthropic, financial, corporate, and civic partners working together to unlock over $5 billion in capital and to unlock and build black wealth and to close racial wealth gaps in the region. With input from hundreds of community members, Groundbreakers working to fundamentally change how and where money flows to, asp to aspiring homeowners and entrepreneurs, starting with Minnesotans who face some of the state's deepest and most persistent disparities. In Minnesota, racial wealth disparities can be traced directly to historic policies and practices. Today, about 77% of white Minnesotans own their homes, while about 29% of black Minnesotans own theirs. As Ground Breaks Community Work Group members articulated, the barriers to home ownership are clear. From the lack of access to generational wealth that can make it difficult to impossible to produce a down payment to practices of financial institutions that deter aspiring black and BIPOC homeowners from seeking a loan. Today, however, Financial institutions, foundations, nonprofits, and corporations in groundbreak are working together to change paradigms and to welcome black homeowners and other communities who have been excluded from this area of wealth building. And together, we seek to shift the burden of making capital available from the families who seek it to the institutions that have it. We're doing this in three ways. First, we're working to aggregate capital from, for a regional down payment assistance program that can provide at least $50,000 in down payment assistance loans for thousands of home buyers. Second, we're designing strategies to unlock as much capital as possible from private sources. And third, we now have four major financial institutions, Bremer Bank, Bell Bank, Huntington Bank, and U.S. Bank that are starting to offer what we refer to as groundbreak endorsed first mortgage products. So these instruments provide more flexible terms for borrowers and aim to promote transparency, consistency, and trust. So in short, the purpose of all of this is to work together to scale solutions and to remove barriers for thousands of aspiring homeowners efficiently and um, I'm sorry, efficiently and predictably. While most resources will come from private partners, there is a critical role for the public sector to play that's necessary to bridge one-time gaps, to maximize those private resources, and to support driving change at scale. Mm -hmm. So yeah. thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Um, Senator Pod, do you have any other testifiers? I do. I believe they're on Zoom. Uh, Jean, if you can state your name for the record and begin your testimony, that would be great. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jean Crane. I am president and CEO of Bremer Financial Corporation, the holding company for Bremer Bank and Bremer Insurance. As a business leader, and particularly as a leader in financial services, I believe I have both the opportunity and the responsibility to, co to commit to real change. The uncomfortable truth is that banks historically played a crucial role in furthering and enforcing the racial structures that systematically disadvantage people of color for decades. Redlining, racial covenants, and bias in lending are real and their undeniable truths in the history of banking with repercussions that have lasted generations. And that means that banks have a responsibility to help build a path forward. Bremer was an early partner with Groundbreak and we along with other financial institutions have been proud to engage in Groundbreak's initiatives to advance black home ownership. Most recently, we have been involved in the work to develop a first mortgage product which is now being piloted and paired with $50,000 in down payment assistance through local, uh, through local, excuse me, local community development financial institutions. To date, six lenders are now offering groundbreak endorsed mortgage products to better serve and importantly welcome 
black homeowners and the homeowners and homeowners of color based on extensive research and insights provided through Groundbreak's community work and their design process. While I offer my perspective as a leader of a financial institution, the beauty of Groundbreak's approach is that it emphasizes a shared responsibility by private and public organizations to help address systemic barriers by investing in those who have not been able to obtain access to what many of us take for granted. Flexible capital is critical to this effort and the state investments are even more valuable as they will be matched and maximized by the private sector. What is different about Groundbreak is that it is a comprehensive and coordinated approach with the goals of creating new generations of homeowners to help generate wealth for many in our community where that opportunity has been missing and finally start shrinking the equity gap. I respectfully request your support and partnership. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Um, now we will take questions. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Pa, for this. And I appreciate uh, the conversation. It's definitely uh, very important. One of the things that's always on my mind when I hear the statistics cited of today's ratio or percentage of home ownership of minorities and how low those numbers are, I think back to, I think it was the opening weeks of this committee, it must have been last year, when we had a, a slide deck here mm -hmm. that showed black home ownership, for example, was significantly higher back in the 50s, mm -hmm. 50s and 60s, and it's lower today. And so the thought in my mind is, if, we're, if the argument being made is that black home ownership is low today because of policies of decades ago, well, I would think that when we were closer to those very terrible policies, that home ownership would have been lower, but it was higher. So how do we explain, is the thought of my mind, how do we explain home ownership rates higher when we go back in time, closer to these very terrible policies, but that home ownership is lower today? And the reason I'm asking that question is because, not, I'm, I'm asking rhetorically, Asking the question is because as we try to address or propose solutions, they need to be solutions that are targeting root causes. And if the home ownership gap is higher today, meaning home ownership of black families is lower in the present day, what is the root cause and how do we know that any of our solutions that are being proposed are actually targeting that root cause or root causes? That's just a commentary. So my question, Madam Chair, uh, to the chief author is on, I would just draw attention on line 1.11. It begins to read, the Minneapolis Foundation and Groundbreak Partners shall establish criteria and procedures for determining eligibility. So the question is, why are we leaving it up to these entities to establish the eligibility criteria? Shouldn't we as a legislature who are considering the appropriation of these funds be the ones that are determining the eligibility criteria. Senator Pa. Um, I will say a few words and I'll let my testifier um, uh, answer your question as well. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Lucero, thank you for the question. Um, I'm more than happy to have conversations with you to make sure that we include certain things that you think are important, but I do agree with you that I don't, I don't believe that this is necessarily saying that they have exclusive, exclusivity in deciding what these criteria are, but that they also um, have a um, um, have a role in just establishing those things. Because we have seen that with our MHFA programs or some of the programs that are existing, that there's definitely limitations to those. And it has not been uh, accessible by everybody in our communities. And so the Minneapolis Foundation and Groundbreak's approach uh, I think is really great and they have some really great ideas about how do we expand it so that people are able to access these. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and let... Uh, uh, yep, I'm happy to step in. Uh, Madam Chair, um, Senator, my name is Kenza Haj Musa. I am uh, here on behalf of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber who is uh, um, in the Groundbreak Coalition. Uh, and to answer that question, part of the 
the beauty of Groundbreak is that there is already um, nonprofits, CDFIs that are doing really excellent work providing down payment assistance and helping families getting into home ownership. The goal of Groundbreak is to really make sure that there's capital at the table that's able to elevate those programs to scale so we don't necessarily need to be reinventing the wheel, but we do want to make sure that um, great programs have the resources to serve more and more um, potential homeowners. Thank you. Senator Lucero, follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate that. So what would make it more comfortable for me is when we as a legislative branch are appropriating money to anybody is that we take the criteria and put them in here. So if there already is established criteria that are in use in practice, then those could be communicated and then put into the text. That would be more comfortable for me. Rather than delegating, essentially giving a check to the agency and then having the agency work with nonprofits to come up with the criteria that as written, it's very ambiguous or it's non-existent. So just some feedback on incorporating what those might be. Because yeah, I'm a big believer in not reinventing the wheel for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Uh, Senator Draham. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you uh, for bringing the bill forward. Um, I think we all agree on the solution. We talk about it every committee hearing. Um, you know, I, if I could, I always like to ask nonpartisan staff a question, and I haven't done that today. <laughs> so um, I guess, uh, Mr. Mueller, could you tell us about how much we spent or budgeted for first-time assistance um, between the agency and the uh, first generational program we did last year? A ballpark? Go ahead. Madam Chair um, and members, there was two different programs that were uh, created last year. Um, the first generation home buyer program received $50 million, and then the, the one that was run by the community-based first-generation home buyer was $100 million. So 150 between the two of them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Graham. Thank you. So, and, and just to give everybody a little perspective, um, we normally don't spend that much for our agency that deals with housing. And so, I, I love the concept of trying to get more people into homes. I think that should be our end goal. Um, I'm just not sure of the timing of this bill. And if, you know, if I was to do it, I would have it statewide and, and not just in one geographic area. Um, I just saw a new home pop up in my district for $30,000. $30,000. Very rare to see one that low, but you can find homes under 100000 in rural Minnesota. And, and I think we all agree buying a home costs too much. Everything costs too much. I, I, I think that's... But I, I just think if we're going to move forward with this concept, I agree with Senator Lucero that I think we need to define what we're going to spend $30 million on and then we need to make sure we have some reporting mechanisms to come back to us to tell us how successful it is, where we got it right, where we got it wrong. Um, but with that, I thank you for bringing the bill forward. Uh, just my thoughts on it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dram. Um, Senator Pa. Um, I just want to thank uh, Madam Chair, Senator uh, Draham for your comments. Um, I absolutely agree that there's definitely things that we can add on to here. Uh, one is uh, maybe some criteria. Two is some reporting back. Uh, but I think what's exciting about this bill that's very unique is its ability to leverage and unlock other investments. And that's what we, um, that's something that we have to continue to strive for because we cannot continue to fund everything ourselves in silo. Uh, if we can partner with uh, many of these entity, entities, whether it's financial institutions, uh, philanthropical uh, uh, institutions, corporations, nonprofits, uh, all of these things, we can solve this issue of shortage of home, affordability of home, so much easier than us trying to do this alone. And that's what's so exciting about this particular bill. And I want to thank Groundbreak 
um, and the Minneapolis Foundation for bringing this bill forward and this proposal as well. And I hope that all of you will support it. Thank you, Senator Pa. And this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Next, we have um, Senator Pappas's bill. Senate file 3232. Um, and Senator Pappas, you have the A3 amendment. Do you want to move that? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to move the A3 amendment, but I'd also like to um, amend us. Yes, let's just do the A3 amendment. Sounds good, and I believe that council just made me aware that you have an oral amendment to the A3. She has an oral amendment, right, and I also have an oral amendment to the bill. Okay, cool. So we, which one do we move first? Do the oral amendment first. Yep, you're right. She's not in the committee. Um, Senator Jaham, will you move the A3 amendment? So moved. Awesome, and then council has uh, an oral amendment. Um, yes, on page one of the A3, line 28, after the second county, insert board. Senator Jam? Board. 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 Yes. Okay. So then I move the oral amendment to the A3 amendment. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. And then, Senator Pappas, you have an amendment to the A3 amendment Yes, as well? Madam Chair, on page 2, line 23, I would like to just delete the appropriation, $10 million, that will be determined by the next committee. Madam Chair, just... So that's to the bill. We'll move the amendment first. Oh, we'll move the amendment Yes. Very briefly. So I think we just adopted the oral amendment to the A3. So I still think we need to adopt the A3 as amended to the bill. Correct. Okay. I thought Senator Pappas had another oral amendment to the amendment. Oh, got it. Okay. So we'll just move the A3 amendment as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Senator Pappas, now you can tell us what your amendment is to the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And maybe Senator Housley would be so kind to move this amendment. But I wanted to, on line 23, page 2, to just delete the appropriation of $10 million because that would be determined by the Capital Investment Committee. Madam uh, Chair. Senator um, Housley. So moved. Awesome. Senator Housley moves the oral amendment from Senator Pappas. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The amendment is adopted. And Senator Pappas, please tell us about your bill as amended. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, and thank you, members, for doing that. This bill would create the Cooperative Manufactured Housing Infrastructure kind of subgrant program and appropriate dollars in bonds to the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency for grants under this program. Minnesota Housing Finance Agency would disperse grants to cities and counties to provide a maximum of 50% of the capital costs of public infrastructure necessary for an eligible cooperative manufactured housing development project. And we all, I'm sure this committee has talked about um, the manufactured housing world and how the housing is so much uh, less expensive than regular housing and really needed throughout our state. Um, a city or county would not be allowed to receive more than 60000 per manufactured housing lot. So the program is designed to encourage cities to invest in manufactured homes and the workforce the tenants represent, ultimately helping cities expand their tax bases and Minnesota build equity where not previously possible. And here to speak more on the bill is Mr. Joel Hansen, the Advocacy and Communications Manager with North Country Cooperative Foundation. Awesome. And if you can state your name for the record one more time and 
you can begin your testimony. Great. Uh, my name is Joel Hansen uh, with North Country Cooperative Foundation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, uh, you obviously know me from uh, our work with preserving manufactured housing. This um, is a little bit of a different approach in which we're looking at new developments of facility built home neighborhoods. And so as uh, Chair Pappas said, um, what this bill would do is allow for cities to receive grants related to the infrastructure for new construction. So not preservation, but the creation of new neighborhoods featuring facility built homes, which would allow for individuals to achieve home ownership at a much lower cost than we traditionally see. And so um, to speak more about that, I believe there's an individual who's on Zoom. Awesome, thank you. And we have Galen Malika. I believe that's how you say your name. If you can come off camera, unmute, and say your name for the record, you can begin your testimony. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair Port and members of the, uh, of the committee. Uh, my name is Galen Malika. I serve as the chair of the Rice County Board of Commissioners. In addition to my role as county commissioner, I also serve as the chair of the Rice County HRA, uh, the chair of the city of Northfield HRA, and I am also the chair of Three Rivers uh, CAP agency that serves four counties in the southeastern uh, area of Minnesota. In these multiple roles, I've seen firsthand the need for more affordable housing, not just in Rice County, but across the Southern Minnesota region and state. Um, especially in greater Minnesota, uh, we have uh, a severe shortage of workforce housing that is affordable housing uh, for working class, but also affordable for our seniors and affordable for our veterans. Um, um, additionally, the options that do exist for this type of housing in our community are typically not ownership based. Thus, we find ourselves with a missing middle of affordable workforce home ownership <clears throat> opportunities that have uh, that has a cascading effect across the region. A shortage of local workers, less kindergartners enrolling into our community schools and an increasingly squeezed tax base. So as we work to remedy this situation, we must think outside the box in how we envision workforce housing. Today's legislation aims to do just that. While municipalities have a desire, municipalities and counties have a desire to innovate, often those innovations in the housing sector come with barriers, unfamiliar with, the t with home types, uh, misconceptions regarding ownership, structure, and different infrastructure needs. However, when um, um, incentives exist for communities to explore new models of housing, particularly workforce, home ownership, those barriers begin to disappear. Further, as Minnesota looks uh, at the housing crisis as a whole, perhaps one of the largest gaps in our approach is the lack of affordable home ownership opportunities. Particularly for first generation home buyers, programs that encourage the development of affordable uh, ownership and allow for Minnesotans to build equity are sorely needed, and the proposal uh, accomplishes that. In conclusion, we are trying to tackle the housing crisis on a local level. We need as many options in the affordable housing toolbox as possible. We also need programs that incentivize uh, municipalities and counties to explore new methods of housing, whether that be new construction types or ownership structures, the desire for doing so, um, uh, for doing something different is there. Municipalities and counties need to help in removing the obstacles to do so. Uh, this program would help accomplish that goal and I encourage its passage. Uh, the other thing that we're also seeing out um, amongst our counties and uh, municipalities is the, the corporate um, hedge funds buying up um, our mobile home parks. Here in Rice County, we now have our third one that has been bought by a corporate hedge fund and they're raising the rates at ridiculous amounts for the monthly rental income. With this um, uh, legislation, it also helps people be able to transition our work, you know, our working class families and seniors and veterans transition into co-op uh, style housing where they actually have an ownership 
and a say in how they live amongst their neighbors. So with that, I thank you um, for your um, consideration and passage of this legislation. And uh, if there's any questions, I am here to answer them. Or you could go to the Brace County uh, website. My email is on there. Once again, Galen Malika, and you could email me as well. Thank you for all that you do. Um, your job is not easy, for, you know, being an elected official. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Galen. Uh, members, questions for Senator Pappas or her testifiers? Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Pappas and the testifiers. So uh, just a question on some clarification. So I would draw your attention to the second page of the, the bill on line 2.2. The sentence begins to read, at a minimum, a county or city may include in its application, and it goes on. I'm, it just seems to be a little bit of an odd verbiage there. So it has, at a minimum, which would imply a must, but then it says they may include. Mm -hmm. So could you just provide some clarification on that? Senator Pappas or Joel? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Lucero, um, when this bill was originally drafted, it was modeled after some of the requirements that were existing within the Greater Minnesota Housing Infrastructure Fund. And so um, without looking at that language, I'm not sure if that was borrowed from this or not. But um, what I can say is um, I, I think it would be the intention of the stakeholders to have city support. And if that comes through a resolution, uh, that seems to make a lot of sense. I will say I think there was uh, an amendment made to the, uh, or an oral amendment made to the previous amendment to try to clarify some of that. And maybe Senate Council can speak to that. But Senate Council, Ms. Painter. Madam Chair um, and members, the whole of Section 1 was replaced with the language in the A3 as amended. So you notice on line 1.28 of the amendment, it says must include in its application. That might address your concern. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, okay, so this... Okay, this was a DE amendment. Is that what I'm reading? Oh, got it. Okay, good deal. Well, for for the yeah for section one. So, and I do see yes, that may is now a must. So it is solved. Good deal. Thank awesome. you. Awesome, members. Any other questions for Senator Pappas? Senator Jaham. Thank you for bringing it forward, uh, Senator Pappas. Thank you, Chair, uh, for recognizing me. Um, I, I love the concept. Um, you know, I, I think it helps one of the barriers to get more of the affordable um, housing across the state. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's, it'd be interesting to know what what is successful with the program and what isn't if it moves forward. Uh, maybe a little healthier on the reporting side back to us so we can make better decisions in the future. Um, but I, I like the concept. I, I hope uh, there's a path forward. So thank you. Awesome. Senator Pappas, closing comments? Uh, Madam Chair, just want to say that the Capital Investment Committee um, cares, as you do, about more affordable housing. And we do have, I think, two communities that are kind of geared up to do this. Northfield is one. We heard from the commissioner. And then the other community that's also very interested is Russo. Thank you, Senator Pappas. Um, the spill will be laid over for possible inclusion. Um, Madam Chair, I think it needs to go to the Capital Investment Committee because that's where it will be funded. Senator Pappas, since it was already heard in Capital Investment, it doesn't need to be sent back, so it will be laid over for possible okay. inclusion. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we have Senator Poor, uh, Chair Poor, on Zoom, and she will give us an update for what next week will look like. I'm sure Senator Lucero is wondering. Thank you, uh, Senator Muhammad, and thank you, members. 
uh, and testifiers today for bringing forward some excellent options for us to put in our supplemental budget bill. Um, this year we've talked a lot about closing the racial home ownership gap, um, creating more housing, preventing homelessness, and I'm really glad to see both investments in programs that we know have been successful and also new and creative ideas. Um, Senator Dreheim, I will say, I know you can feel my pain. It's a lot harder to spend $10 million than it is to allocate a billion dollars. Um, so we will be working on that this week. Um, I want to let members know that my goal is to get out uh, and post the draft of our supplemental budget by Friday of this week. And then we will hear that bill on Tuesday of next week. We've been advised that we likely will not uh, be able to have afternoon committees on Thursday because we'll be on the floor. So I would like to try to do that all in one day. So I'm trying to give folks as much um, time in advance with that bill as possible. We will also only be hearing public testimony on it if there are pieces that are substantially changed from what we have already heard this year in committee, um, just so that our committee has plenty of time to discuss and make any amendments or changes. And members also, if you have priorities of what we've heard today or what we've heard previously this year that you would like to see in the supplemental budget bill, if you can let me know those as soon as possible uh, so we can try to accommodate as much as possible, um, those are my updates unless anyone has questions. Thank you, Chair Port. Senator Lucero, I believe, has a question. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Port. So just not a question, but just a comment, just to keep it on your radar, because I know that the session is going to be over before we know it. And the, HO, the topic of HOA is still uh, a high priority that I'm hearing a lot of feedback on. So just wanted to make sure it had fallen off the radar. And hopefully there's an opportunity in the coming weeks here to be able to have uh, a hearing on that. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Uh, I, I very much agree with you. Um, I am hopeful that we'll have a clearer idea of which days and for what amount of time we'll be on the floor in coming weeks so that we can schedule some informational hearings. And that is right at the top of my list. Awesome. There is no further business today and the committee is adjourned until next week. Thank you, members. Don't miss me too much.